wait. In, in Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, it says this, whoever pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. Whoever pursues righteousness and love finds life. The Bible talks a lot about righteousness. Righteousness is mentioned over 500 times in the Bible. 500 times in the Bible the words righteous and righteousness are used. So, the Bible says over and over again, righteousness. So Noah was a righteous man because he walked with God. Abram believed in the Lord, and that was credited to him as righteousness. We talks about the God of Israel being righteous in all of his ways, that he is a righteous judge, that he judges and rules the world in righteousness, that we are declared righteous, that we can be righteous. All right, so, but, but what does that mean? So when you start to think about that word righteous or righteousness, what is the image that comes to your mind? Do you think about, like, like the gavel and the judge who declares you righteous? Do you think more about the scales of justice, where, where God maybe weighs right and wrong, good and bad? What about thinking about righteous in a completely different way, though? You ever think about righteousness as a group of people loving and supporting one another? Ever think about righteousness as just you before God? I want to unpack that word righteousness and what that means this morning, looking at some of Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. But before we do that, will you pray with me? Father God, you are amazing. You are awesome, you are holy, you are perfect, you are just, you are righteous. Your, your Bible, your word says that we have been declared righteous, that we are righteous in your sight. But God, I, I want to talk this morning, I want to open your word. I want you to reveal what, what it means for us to truly be righteous before you and with one another. Lord God, as Ed said earlier, we are your representatives. What we do, what we say, how we act matters. Lord God, I, I pray that use your spirit would fill us and guide us and help us. Because if there's one thing that is very clear, we can't do this on our own. It is only your grace, your love, your compassion that makes any of this possible. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say. Amen. Amen. So when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus keeps coming back to this, this term righteousness over and over again. He says, Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Jesus says, seek first his, God's kingdom, and his righteousness. See, God's righteousness first above everything else, and then everything else will be given to you as well. And then, just a couple of verses later, Jesus makes this bold, audacious claim. So here's, here's what Jesus says, and I, before we get there, you need to keep this in mind. The Pharisees are the religious elite of the day. The Pharisees are the ones that, that all of the regular people are looking up to, and they're like, wow. That, that's what it means to be righteous, because they, they are following all of the laws. So if you count them, there are 16, 613 laws in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. And the Pharisees weren't just following those. They added thousands of other rules and regulations on and around those laws to make sure that they didn't even get close to crossing the line, to make sure that they were actually following the rules. So then they have not just 613, but thousands of these rules that they're following. And then Jesus makes this claim. He says, I tell you the truth. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. I can't imagine being a first century Jew and hearing that. I mean, like, wait, wait a minute, no, no, they're following thousands of laws. I'm seeing them do this every day, and you're saying that unless I'm better than that, 
I'm not entering the kingdom of heaven. Like, if, if I got to be better than that, then none of us have a shot. Huh. Here's the thing. Our actions do not make us righteous. Our actions do not make us righteous. See, the Pharisees are trying to do the right thing. They've got all of the check marks. But, but here's the thing. Righteousness is not a checklist. It's, it's not like if you get more smiley faces than poop emojis at the end of the day that you're good. Can I say that? Brownie face emojis, then, if that's more appropriate. It's, it's not like that it's a formula where if I say the right thing or do the right thing at the right time and hang out with the right people and support the right political party and vote the right way in the right election at the right time, that then I am righteous. It's not a formula. It's not a checklist. Paul makes that abundantly clear in his letter to the Romans. He says there is no one righteous, not even one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one righteous, not even one. He goes on 10 verses later to say, no one, no one, zero zip zilts, not a no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. You, you can't checklist your way to righteousness. You can't checklist your way to righteousness. Here's this thing about righteousness, and, and as I started studying it, it just, it, it really was sort of just an eye opener for me. Righteousness is relational. I always thought of righteousness as that list of do's and don'ts, that checklist. That, that's the church that I grew up in. Do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. That's how we're going to tell if you're in or you're out. Righteousness is relational. Righteousness is a covenantal term. Righteousness is, is about our relationship to God and to one another. In the book of Jeremiah, it sums the covenant up this way. God says, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. That's the covenant in a nutshell. God says, I'll be your God. You be my people. Righteousness is in that covenant. It's found and wrapped up in that covenant. The Episcopal Church defines righteousness this way. It is living in right relationship with God and with each other. Righteousness is living in relationship, right relationship with God and others. Reverend Todd Foster writes this. He says, righteousness is all about relationship. Jesus is concerned not with how people are doing on a scorecard of technical law following, but how they are doing and caring and nurturing genuine relationships with God and with one another. That Greek word for righteousness that's most often thought of as righteousness means literally right-relatedness. Right relatedness. The basic meaning of righteousness, says the New Dictionary of Theology, is comes from the Hebrew word sedek, which is not an abstract idea of justice or virtue, but an understanding of right relationship and standing in your community. See, righteousness is wrapped up in relationship. Think of it this way. I'm going to share with you the parable of the clean and dirty rooms. It's not in the Bible, don't look. The parable of the clean and messy rooms. On one beautiful Saturday afternoon, mom decides that the kids really need to clean their rooms. And so she gives her two children, Eli and Elsa, very specific instructions. She says, you need to make your bed. Your toys need to be put away. Books need to be returned to the bookshelf. Your dirty clothes goes in the hamper. Your clean clothes go in your drawer or in your closet. You have one out. <laughs> Elsa, who is the youngest, just smiles and she says, All right, Mommy, but I need help. I don't think I can do it on my own. Mom says, No, no, no. You go try and do it on your own. Eli, on the other hand, looks outside, sees it as a beautiful day, and he is furious. It's not fair. 
It's not fair. Why do I have to clean up my room? You, we only get like three nice days a year in Minnesota. You want me to clean my room? And Dad keeps saying that it's his house, so why doesn't he clean the room? Because after all, it's his room. And I didn't buy those toys. I don't have any money. They're your toys. You bought them. You clean them. <laughs> Eli stomps off, actually cursing at his mom as he stomps up the stairs. While Elsa is in her room, not a sound is being heard. Eli is in his room and he is chucking his toys. There is stomping, there is screaming, there is crying. An hour later, mom goes up the stairs. She knocks on Eli's door and she's a little afraid to open it. But she does, and the room is spotless. And Eli looks at her and says, I hope you're happy. I hate you and your stupid rules. When mom, with tears in her eyes, goes into Elsa's room, she sees that the bed is made and a couple things are put away, but there's a pile in the middle of the room. And Elsa starts to cry and she says, Mommy, I have so many things I didn't know where to put them and I can't reach the closet. I'm sorry that I didn't clean my room. All right, so now Elsa, she didn't do what she was told. Eli did exactly what he was told. But which one of them honored their mother? It was Elsa, wasn't it? She, she didn't follow the rules. She didn't do them. She did the best that she could. And yet she honored her mother more than the one who followed every single rule. Jesus tells a parable in his time that's a little bit like that. It's about the tax collector and the Pharisee, the Pharisee who follows every single one of the rules. He goes to the temple and he says, I thank God that I am not like these people because I follow all the rules. I am good. They are not. And the tax collector, that despised, that hated tax collector who's cheating his own people, he can't even look up to heaven because he knows he doesn't deserve it. He just hangs his head and says, I am not worthy. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, that it is the tax collector who was justified. That word justified means literally declared righteous. It is the Pharisee who, who follows every rule that walks out of there not righteous. And the tax collector with real repentance in his heart who is declared righteous. See, righteous isn't about the check marks. It's not about following every single one of the rules. It is about right relatedness to God and honoring Him with your thoughts, attitudes, and actions. Righteousness is about being right rela rightly related to God and each other. Pastor and author Tara Beth Leach, I don't know if there's any relation or not, Nancy. Tara Beth Leach writes this. Righteousness is not just about a holy me and my relationship to God. It is about a holy we and our relationship to God and to one another. In the Bible, we are called to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbors as ourselves. Let, let's fast forward to the end of the day with Eli and Elsa. See, Dad has this, Dad has this uh, habit of reading to his children every single night. But today has been a strange day for some reason, and their nighttime ritual that night somehow turns into a competition. So they are supposed to get their teeth brushed, to get their pajamas on, go to the bathroom, grab a book, come downstairs, and then dad will read a story. Today, for some reason, it becomes a competition, and Eli gets on his pajamas, and he, he runs to pick out a book, and seeing her opportunity to get into the bathroom first, Elsa runs into the bathroom, and she starts brushing her teeth, and then it occurs to her that if Eli can't find his toothbrush, he's not going to make it there first, and her story will be first. So as she's going to the bathroom, she takes Eli's toothbrush and drops it in the toilet. <laughs> she flushes, but of course it doesn't go down. It's, it's too big. But then she runs out of the bathroom. She gets on her pajamas, grabs her book, 
And as she's running down the stairs, she hears the screams from the bathroom. Her brother has just found his toothbrush in the toilet, and he comes thundering down the stairs after her. And she has just about made it to dad with her book, but Eli reaches out and trips her. But as he tries to go over to her, she reaches up and grabs him, and he falls. And now both of them are laying there on the floor, bloody and crying in front of their dad. Which one of them is dad happiest with? <laughs> Which one of them is dad going to be like, oh, you got here first, let's read your story. Now see, dad is not happy with either of them. He, his toothbrush wasn't flushed. Nobody tripped him. Nobody hit him. Nobody pushed him. Nobody yelled at him. But he's not going to be okay when his, with his children when they are not okay with each other. Wow. Jesus makes this point over and over again in the Sermon on the Mount. See, when he's teaching one day, somebody comes up to him and says, what, what's the greatest command? Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now the person just asks her, what's the greatest command? But Jesus, Jesus doesn't even pause. He just says, here's the first one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The person asking him asked for the greatest commandment. Jesus says, no, 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 no. They are tied together. Love God, love your neighbor. All of the law and all the prophets hang on that. It's the point of the law. It is the essence of the law. It's what it is all about. It is about our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. Three times in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us three different illustrations about our love for one another. It's in a section called the Antithesis. And what that means is Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, but I'm telling you, this is what it really means. This is what it's really about. All right, here's the first one. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, or you idiot, is answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of hell. Oh, let me ask this. What if Jesus actually means what he says? What if he's not just exaggerating to prove a point? See, what Jesus is saying is, you've heard this. Do not murder. I'm telling you that murder is the outward action of what's coming out of your heart, the hatred and the animosity and the judgment in your heart. Start there. Start there. The person who hates their brother and sister in their heart, the person who is judgmental against them in their heart, you're the one in danger. You're the one in danger. Don't you just get it? Murder is just a physical act of what's already coming out of your heart. He goes on and he gives another example. He says, therefore, if you are offering your gift in an altar and you remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there. In other words, don't, don't bring your book to dad and think that dad's going to bring you up, scoop you up on your lap when you have just been fighting. No, no, no. Make it right with your brother and sister and then come to the altar. Then come to me. Now you need to remember that, that when Jesus is saying this, this is back in the first century. This, this was not just a quick car ride to church. There wasn't a synagogue and a church and a temple on every corner. People would have gone sometimes miles and miles. It could have been a five-day journey to the temple to make a sacrifice. And Jesus says, I, I know you just walked five days to get here. But if, if it's not right with your neighbor, walk home, make it right, and then come back. He goes on again, one more example. He says, settle matters quickly with your adversary. Now, note he's talking about your adversary, not just that neighbor that you love, your adversary who is taking you to court. Do not do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last money. Over and over again, Jesus says, make sure things are right with you and your neighbor. See, right relatedness, righteousness, 
is about right standing between us and God and us and one another. I love what, what Ed said earlier during the communion meditation. We are Christ's ambassadors. He wants us not just to be his representatives, but to be his righteous representatives. That doesn't mean that we're all proud because we follow all of the rules. It means that we understand our position with God. We know that there is no one righteous, not even one. We know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know that it is by his grace and his grace alone that we are saved. We know, like Paul says, that I, I am the worst of sinners. You know what? If you are the worst of sinners, it is really, really difficult to look down on someone else. So when we understand our relationship with God, when we come to him broken and repentant, then we are righteous. And when we go to our fellow brothers and sisters with that same attitude, we are declared righteous. We are righteous when we are in right relationship with God and with one another. That's what it means to be righteous. So let me ask, how is that relationship with God? Have you made it into a list of rules or check marks? And let's face it, that those of you who have been in a relationship with a significant other, you don't need a checklist. If you do, let's talk. <laughs> I don't need a checklist to love my wife. You don't need a checklist to love God or love your neighbor. How is your relationship with God going? Are you spending time talking to him? Are you spending time listening to him? Start there. And then let me ask, how is your relationship with others? Are you starting with an attitude of humility or judgmentalism? So it's going to be hard to have a relationship with others when you think that you are better. Over and over and over, the Bible tells us to build one another up, to encourage one another, to compliment rather than criticize, to really invest. When we do those two things, when we are right with God and we are right with each other, we are acting in righteous ways. It is God and God alone who can declare us righteous. And righteous is about living in right relationship with him and one another. Would you stand and pray? <clears throat> Father God, there is no one righteous, not even one. And yet you give us a glimpse of what the kingdom of God in the future in heaven will look like. Where there is no more tears, there are no more sorrows, there is no more backbiting, there is no more judgmentalism, there is no more condemnation. And yet you invite us to live in that reality today as an ambassador, as a representative of you. When we start to do that, when we start to take seriously our relationship with you and our relationship with one another, when we, when we come with that attitude of humility, we start to get a glimpse of what the kingdom of God is like. And it is beautiful. It is beautiful. God, we can't do it on our own. We don't have the strength. We don't have the patience. We don't have the endurance. So I pray that we come to you repentant and with a heavy heart because we know that when we humble ourselves, you will lift us up. We know when we come broken, you will make us whole. We know when we come and ask for forgiveness, you will say, well done good and faithful servant. God, help us have that attitude towards you and towards one another. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.